Let's welcome the speaker again. It's my great pleasure to be here to talk about um, the two of our recent work, uh, quite simple work, um, the different gear of what we have heard today in this conversation about neutrino. Yeah, in this talk, I will mostly talk about astrophysical neutrinos and then be talking about the so called faster neutrino flavor oscillation and then the impact in the context of neutron star mergers. Okay, and then yeah, those two works are in collaboration with uh, Irene Tambora and Oliver Hughes and Thomas Yanka uh, during this year. So yeah, because this is more about astrophysics, so I would like to spend some time, some time talking about general astrophysical background, and then yeah, if you have any questions, just stop me at any time, okay? So we already know that um, in the, this October, the, 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 the announcement of the first detection of binary neutron star merger, so-called GW170017, and the associated show gamma ray burst, and the, the actual physical chance and kilonova observation, co-observation of all those three different signals. And then this observation, those co-observations, basically confirm the long conjecture that the binary neutron star mergers are one of the dominating source for gravitational wave emission, and also confirm that those astrophysical systems being the origin of short gamma ray bursts, and also the origin of the most of the heavy elements that we have on the, in the universe, produced by the so-called rapid neutron capture processes that power the um, astrophysical transient called kilonovae through the radioactive decay of the nuclei. And uh, yeah, on the left hand side, this is just an artistic picture that gives you, you see the, the ripple of the space time and then the spin jet along the rotation axis of the progenitor system and the, the more or less isotropic feature from those kilonovae. And then if you look at into the detailed numerical simulation, then you see that yeah, initially the two neutron stars are sort of separated like this. And then, of course, they, 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 they in spiral uh, emit, emit a gravitational wave, and then the orbit of those two stars comes closer and closer, eventually they collide, and then this collision uh, releases a lot of energy and then throw a lot of matter away. And also, the end product, depending on the initial progenitor system masses, uh, there could be a hypermass neutron star or massive object in the center, and then surrounded by an accretion disk, which is more like in the blue or yellowish color there. Okay, and then eventually after some tens of 15, 15 millisecond time scale, the central object, this remnant system can be sort of stabilized into the exosymmetric system. So it's just like a rotating system with a huge uh, massive sky in the center. And then this guy may eventually collapse into a black hole depending again on the total mass of the system. Okay, and before this discovery, all those signals were already predicted by a different group of people, different effort. And uh, this slide I took from this paper from Fernand and Metzger last year before the discovery just shows you uh, the summary of those different uh, multi-messenger signature that we expect to see from this kind of merger event. And then you can see that before, if this, this marks the merge, the time when the two neutrons start light, and then before they merge, it mostly we expect that we only see the gravitational wave in spiral signal that were detected this time, was detected this time. Okay, however, uh, after the merge, we still expect to see all different kinds of signal, including the possible gravitational wave emission from the oscillating, rotating mer merger remnant, and also, more interestingly, is the those, uh, electromagnetic emission. For example, yeah, we expect to see the shock gamma burst, which was actually observed uh, in this time. Okay, and then if there's a strong black hole, if there's a black hole formed in the center, then the shock gamma ray may be powered by the creating material around surrounding the black hole. Uh, on the other hand, um, in the longer time scale, we, ex we expect to see the optical light or the infrared light coming from this uh, nuclear, the, the decay of the radioactive nuclei from the matter being ejected during the merger. And then the color of this so called kilonovi could be. A bit could be picked on different uh, band. For example, yeah, in the very early time, it could be even in the ultraviolet region, and as time goes on, it could be becoming blue or red. And uh, at very longer time scale, much longer than days, there could be even a radio signal coming out from a collision of those ejectiles in interstellar medium. Okay, and then why? Because the title is about neutrino, and then you didn't see any neutrino is flat. So why are we talking about this flat? The, the the point of talking about this is flat is because. Um, just before the, this detection, theorists um, predict or suspect that if somehow we see a blue kilonovi emission, 
of the time scale of days. This indicates that there are significant amount of matter being thrown out from the merging system containing quite a substantial amount of protons in the ejecta. And then you know the system initially consists of a lot of neutrons, and then you can convert the initial neutrons into protons. You need a lot of neutrino interactions on the neutrons and protons. So if you see such a blue signature in the kilonova observation, that means that neutrinos play an important role in this merging post-merger system. OK, so that's the key idea, basically, of this talk. And the, 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 those neutrinos could be emitted from, for example, the central uh, very massive neutron star or from the inner part of the accretion disk. Now, let's look at what we actually saw uh, in this detection. So, yeah, this left-hand side yeah, just show, basically shows you the rotational wave chirp as the, the, the frequency increase as the time goes closer to merge. And uh, here, this is the gamma ray spectra that we see. There's a, almost 1.7 one, one second delay uh, to the final major gravitational signature. And then the point of this talk is that we look at this uh, kilonova observation that we see at a time scale of, say, one day to two, four days. And then indeed, you see that in, for this particular event, at the time of, say, 1.2 days, this upper red color, the, the major the photon spectra peaks at the wavelength about, say, 500 uh, nanometers. Okay, and then that is exactly the color of blue. Okay, so this direct detection of the early blue kilonova signature tells us that, uh, yeah, the kilonova or the ejecta uh, is strongly, the, its composition is strongly uh, reshaped by the neutrinos that coming from the post-merger Okay, so then let's look at again uh, the neutrino, what are the typical uh, characteristics in terms of the energy luminosity and energy, energy of those neutrinos coming from the system. And uh, somewhat different from the, if you are more familiar with cochlear supernova, then you know that the proton neutron star must be leptonized, meaning that they emit in total more in electron neutrino than electron anti neutrino. And in the case of the binary neutron star merger, it's the other way around because of the initial very neutron richness and also somehow some kind of self-regulating uh, mechanism. Basically, the post-merger phase, the whole remnant keep protonizing. Okay, so that means that we this post-merger this remnant system emit more electron anti neutrino compared to electron neutrinos. Okay, and uh, this is. One table I took from a simulation paper uh, published in 2014, and you can see indeed that the energy luminosity of electron anti neutrino is almost twice larger than that of electron neutrino. And the mu and tau neutrino are more suppressed because they can only come from the basically the surface of the hypermassive neutron star, while the other electron flavors can come from the torus. Okay, so you can also imagine that if now the, the remnant of the hypermassive neutron star collapsed into a black hole, then there would be basically a negligible amount of mu and tau neutrino and the anti neutrinos. Okay? So that's the astrophysical settings of this kind of astrophysical object. And oh yeah, and then the other important thing, because we talk about oscillations, that mean it, when, when we see that there's a large difference in terms of um, energy luminosity among different flavors, then that means that if there's some mechanism that can trigger flavor oscillation among different flavors, that this change of energy spectra could have a large impact on the role of neutrino in those ejecta, uh, the, the ejecta composition, and also on the kilonova light curve. Okay? So we already heard in the first talk of this session that yeah, neutrino, indeed, we expect neutrino oscillation to occur uh, through various experiments and uh, observations. And we know very well how the flavor oscillation happens in the vacuum and when neutrino propagates through matters, for example, through the solar interior. However, um, the theoretical understanding of the flavor oscillation in astrophysical system where neutrinos are abundantly present are still very, very poor. And this is because uh, in a regime where neutrinos are very much abundant, much maybe, for example, the number of density of neutrinos are much larger than the other uh, electrons or protons or neutrons, then the dominating contribution to the full scattering potential could be coming from neutrino-neutrino self-induction. <laughs> okay? 
and then this neutrino neutrino self interaction to describe light in the dense system. We can use the formalism of the density matrix, and you can we're gonna transform the density matrix to so that you describe as a function of time and the spatial and the momentum coordinates in the basically a seven dimensional system, and you try to solve an equation of motion of this, and uh, in this equation of motion, this first term is a commutator of uh, effective Hamiltonian, which is a neutrino density matrix, tells you how wave oscillation would occur, <laughs> and uh, there could be the collision term that changes the momentum of those neutrino propagating around. And if we now consider where the neutrino only fits string, then we neglect the collision term, and we only talk about a wave oscillation term. And then in this flavor observation, Hamiltonian term, it contains in this dense neutrino environment the summation of all neutrino interaction contribution uh, of the, your target neutrino with all the background propagating neutrino. So already you immediately see that this problem is in fact a many body content system. Because to, to solve the flavor state of one neutrino, you need to know what all other neutrinos are doing in the system. So this gives you. Yeah, the many body nonlinear quantum system. And then you can also imagine that it's in the strong coupling regime because you can imagine that yeah, if your number density of neutrinos are very big, then the neutrino neutrino Hamiltonian strength is basically proportional to GF times the number density of your neutrinos. And then this can be much larger than the vacuum Hamiltonian strength. So that means that the system is in the strong coupling regime. So if you combine those two effects, then you expect to see some kind of collective behavior to occur in, in, in such an astrophysical large-scale system. And uh, this was indeed uh, extensive studied in the context of cochlear supernovae by many authors in the past uh, 10 or 15 years. Okay, How, yeah. but you can also see that um, to solve uh, this seven-dimensional Boltzmann type transport equation, it is pretty, pretty much a cubism uh, a very difficult task. Okay, so at, actually at this moment, nobody is able to solve this problem in its full degree. So in the case of cochlear supernova, people make uh, some assumption about the environment, for example, assume some particular symmetry or some steady state approximation, then you can try to reduce the number of degree of freedom here. However, in the case of neutron star merger, you already see that the system is very pretty much an isotropic. So you can't make much assumption about that. So you have to somehow, in the future, you have one way to deal with um, almost like a four or five dimensional problem. However, before we jump onto that, we can do some preliminary work to discuss what type of flavor oscillation can happen uh, by trying to linearize the equation of motion and then study, like, if you have the vacuum term that gives you some small perturbation that can induce the flavor oscillation, then how fast the small perturbation uh, for the mixed state could arise as a function of time. Okay, then this gives us an idea how flavor oscillation can, in, in what time scale or length scale, flavor oscillation can happen in such an astrophysical system. And uh, this so called linear analysis um, basically, yeah, you just do the linearize the equation of motion and then try to find the solution of your dispersion relation. So, so you have a Fourier mode, and then you have omega and k, and then you put that into the equation, and then for given k, you find the corresponding omega, for example. And then if there's, there exists a complex solution, that means that you put any perturbation inside the system will grow exponentially, and then lead to large flavor conversion. So that's the key idea of this flavor a linear instability analysis. And then in dealing, yeah, this plot just shows you an example. For example, in this case, where you have a uh, more electron neutrino in the forward propagating compared to uh, electron anti neutrino back propagating. And for some particular uh, wave number, then you only find the complex solution in the, uh, the time domain. And that means that the oscillation would grow exponentially with that particular frequency um, in time. And uh, people find that quite interestingly, um, if there's. Yeah, so if, uh, if I now sit at a point far away from the neutrino emitting source, and I look back from the neutrino emission, and then if I see a local angular distribution, of, meaning a clothing of the neutrino electron number, meaning that at some particular angular space, I have electron 
anti-neutrino you know, more than that of electron neutrino you know, number density, differential number density, or in some other solid angle range, it's the other way around. Then the so-called fast flavor conversion may happen, and then in a very, very short time scale, you will see what I mean by short time scale. And this is illustrated by this very simple work from Pascal et al. Uh, just published this year. But yeah, they assume that this is some cosine angular space, uh, uh, angular distribution in the that differential number density distribution in the angular space of cosine theta, and then they assume a symmetry in five direction. And then here they have a electron neutrino anti neutrino axis in some particular angular range compared to electron neutrino. And then this is the setup to trigger the phase oscillation. And then they indeed find out that the uh, flavor evolution type, type, the flavor conversion time scale is proportional to the inverse of the neutrino interaction strength. And then this implies a length scale of centimeter or even less, given the typical neutrino number density. And then this is in a simple, highly simplified simulation they did uh, by using different number of parameters in their model. And uh, you see that the electron neutrino flavor survival probability can indeed change in the time scale of nanosecond, meaning a length scale of centimeter. And if you think about astrophysical size, typically we consider something like kilometers. And then this size is so short, centimeters. So that means that this flavor conversion basically happens immediately after neutrino decouples. Okay. So. okay. And now why this is particularly interesting for neutron star merger, this is because we say neutron star merger protonize. And then if neutrons are merged protonized, and then the electron neutrino typically they decouple from a smaller emission surface compared to the electron neutrinos, then that means that if you look back, sitting in the point P, and then you look back from the neutrino initial point, then you would have definitely some angular space where you have more electron anti neutrino, like the pink shaded region, then some angular space you have more electron neutrino. So that is the condition we say that is favorable for fast flavor oscillation. And then based on this idea, we try to parameterize, construct some very simple model where uh, yeah, we just assume this kind of flat disk emission of neutrinos and then use some characteristic neutrino emission luminosity and the average energy uh, guided by uh, astrophysical simulation. And indeed, we find that uh, now this is the surface of my merger remnant. And then above that, uh, basically everywhere I find a uh, flavor instability, meaning that this type of flavor conversion should occur. And the flavor instability is again typically the, the time scale length scale of centimeter. Okay. And this is kind of a general result we find for any reasonable parameters of that per parameterize the system. And the question that we had after that is that okay, does this picture remain beyond this highly parameterized model and the what what would be the impact on the nuclear synthesis and the kilonova observational observables? Okay, so then we go a step forward. We try to uh, collaborate with astrophysical modeler and then try to use the uh, more realistic neutrino emission parameters from the astrophysical simulation. And then in this work, uh, we did uh, just published um, this, uh, this this month, uh, next month, that we take we examine a black hole accretion disk system uh, with parameters given there. And uh, that astrophysical simulation detail can be found in this paper of use that O published 2015. And then what's the, the point is that you, in fact, you see that in the whole phase where the electron, uh, the neutrinos are dominantly emitted, the number density of your electron neutrino is again smaller than that of electron anti neutrinos. So the protonization is confirmed. And then with this protonization, that slightly changing time, we still find that flavor instability, again, in the time scale of centimeter, length scale of centimeter, happens at this different phase of the post-merger evolution. But now, the region and the strength of this flavor instability changes as a function of time. However, despite that this change as a function of time, most of the neutrinos that, go, that are coming out from the neutrino emitting surface will still pass through the, 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 the unstable region, meaning that their flavor, eventually their flavor would be uh, altered by the faster flavor conversion. And we didn't solve the four equation of motion, so then to discuss the impact on the nuclear synthesis and the kilonova lighter, we simply assume that the faster flavor conversion leads to a full flavor equal partition among different flavors. And this is 
um, inspired by the fact that the observation length scale is so short compared to the actual physical scale and all others, the all other scale in the system. And if we do this assumption, then we see that um, the proton richness of the system uh, in the ejector coming out from the, the, the merger remnant uh, it can be shifted largely from more proton rich see this those, those, those orange line here to more much more neutron rich side. And then if we calculate the neutron a nuclear synthesis outcome, this would indicate that there's a change of loss length and night fraction by a factor of a thousand. And this is very likely to change the expected kilonovat color from say blue to red. So this work is sort of in support uh, to what people conclude from this particular observation that this particular event does not immediately collapse into a black hole because otherwise uh, this part of the ejector driven away by neutrino would not give you the blue light kilon of the observation. So this is somewhat in, in, in accordance with all other observations. So with that, uh, it comes to my summary. So. Uh, I hope I convince you that the recent electromagnetic follow-up kilonova observation of this gravitational wave merger event from binary neutron star merger suggests that the neutrino plays quite an important role in this system. And also the chance of directly observing them are not so great, uh, minimal, because also we, don't, we didn't see any of neutrino in this particular event. However, they influence other observables indirectly by changing the composition of the ejector. And uh, in such a merger remnant system, conditions for fast neutrino field oscillation is strongly uh, favored. And this is because that the merger remnant has to protonize differently from supernovae. And we try to do some exploratory, exploratory work on the impact of such flavor conversion on the electromagnetic signature. And we find that it can be quite substantial. And the future work in the more in the neutron star uh, accretion disk system also needs to be done and uh, improve the detailed numerical modeling is also need to be, 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 be performed in the future to really clarify this issue. So yeah, let's summarize the talk. Thanks for the question. Any questions? Maybe you said it, but I missed it. So, so when you say facts, how fast it is? It's fast. So, yeah, because the astrophysical time scale is pretty long. Uh, yeah, so, so this, sorry. This flavor conversion initial growth rate of the flavor octagonal part is the, the growth rate is in that scale of centimeter, high scale of nanoseconds. And this is much shorter compared to any other astrophysical high scale or band scale. That, that's right. And therefore, in, in this context, is there even a slow conversion at all? Uh, there's, in principle, we expect to still have slow conversion, but that slow conversion we expect to happen uh, after this phase conversion has already occurred. And if this phase conversion already brings the flavor set into full equal partition, then there will be no slow flavor conversion. So this, this type of phase flavor conversion should occur first. And uh, if there's any... I understand, but yeah. I guess my, that's exactly my point. What, once this fast conversion happens, so you, you bring all the flavor into equal partition, and then whatever comes after it doesn't really matter. If, if that is the end state, then whatever comes out doesn't really matter. And this phase flavor conversion would be the oscillation that affect the composition of the data. Right, so then I'm asking, is there is there a circumstance where this fast conversion doesn't happen at all? Uh, for example, quark has supernovae. We expect that in supernovae, this type of flavor. Uh, that's yeah. a different astrophysical process. I mean, is there an underlying is. neutrino model where this fast conversion doesn't happen? Uh, what do you mean by underlying model? I'm just saying, is there a, a model of neutrino, uh, a mass is whatever, <coughs> where this fast conversion does not happen? Um, so to my knowledge, if in the neutron star merger, post merger remnant system, this conversion would likely to occur because of the protonization, independently from, for example, the mass hierarchy. Okay. That, that, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Okay. Good. So you cannot use this to learn anything about the underlying structure of the neutrino set. 
um, not likely at this moment because these are just standard model processes. Just a quick question. You were saying in this uh, dense neutrino state, you have a strong interaction, but then you throw away the uh, collision term because you said they are free streaming. But if they are strongly interacting, why are they free streaming? So, so, so this strong, um, strong coupling is in the flavor space only. It's not in the physical interaction space. And of course, yeah, if the oscillation dense scale or time scale is much shorter, is much longer than the collision time scale, then we should then throw away any collision effect, right? But if you can see that this oscillation time scale is nanoseconds, and then even in the most center of the proton neutron star, when density is about, say, nucleus saturation density, the time scale for the collisions are still small, uh, larger than this space oscillation time scale. But then you said in a calculated experiment where you don't have this fast oscillation, so then you <coughs> have to take into account the Term? Yeah, so that's a typical assumption that people adopted when studying those. So that like, we usually assume there's no flare oscillation at all before they decouple. And then this oscillation effect, those oscillation effects come from where only the forward skirt, coherent forward scattering takes place. So basically all neutrinos are just propagating like light through water, and then they only, on, the only change is the, 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 the reflective index. Okay. Assess uh, uh, again.